All right, I, I, in, in a few uh, sentences, uh, I will just try to give you the, some of the highlights of uh, Professor Frechet's uh, contributions, uh, one of which was the development of the concept of chemically amplified photoresist, opening a new area of, in the fabrication of microelectronic devices. devices. Uh, his later work on dendrimers uh, has been used to explore applications including deliv delivery of therapeutic materials and biological separations. Uh, he has more than 880 publications with 200 patents to his credit. Uh, it is my pleasure again on behalf of Al Faisal University, the College of Science, its dean, Dr. Theo Goosen, who is with us today, and my colleagues, faculty members, and students uh, please join me in welcoming our honored speaker. Well, thank you very much. It is uh, an honor to be here. Of course, it's a great honor to get this prize. Uh, I must admit it was totally unexpected. And uh, it's a nice surprise. Especially, uh, I must say, I have lived in the kingdom now for the last nine years and learned a bit about the history of the kingdom. And of course, King Faisal is a very special person. His influence on the kingdom and the world has been very great. And it's a great honor to be here. This is actually not my first visit to this university. I came in 2011 to give a lecture. And I must say, it wasn't a nice auditorium such as this. This must be brand new. Uh, the university is growing, it's uh, beautiful, it's always a pleasure to come and visit it. And also I have been able to observe the growth of the institution as they are building a new branch of the university in Jeddah. And it looks like a very impressive undertaking, mostly on the medical side. But it's nice to see that this institution, which is quite young, is growing so well. So it's a pleasure to be back here. Today I uh, will uh, tell you a little bit about work which is not very recent work, but uh, which has had some lasting value. And I will focus not on the whole topic which is on the screen, I will focus on the first part, this polymers for microelectronics, so as not to overwhelm the audience. We all know about uh, the many applications of polymers. Uh, polymers, of course, are used in uh, making uh, bottles. We all have a water bottle with us. By the way, it's pretty important to know what we do with it afterwards, okay? Because there are way too many bottles around us. Uh, we uh, use them to make uh, things such as uh, rubber tiles. And uh, it was mentioned that I have a number of patents. I have about a dozen on uh, tiles, how to make a new rubber which uh, resists ozone. It's a rubber which is used today in a number of cars. It's a very, very long-lasting material, but very expensive. We also know that polymers are used in what is called composites. Composites uh, where you might, for example, impregnate a fiber. It could be a glass fiber. It could be a carbon fiber with a polymer to make something that you can shape. For example, making the skin of an aircraft. 
And we know about the Boeing 787, for example, which is made of carbon fiber impregnated with a polymer. So these composites are very important. We also know about the applications of polymers in capturing light in a solar cell. The idea is uh, to make a solar cell which instead of being rigid, glass-like, would be flexible. This is really not very commercial today because the efficiency of these cells is not quite sufficient for their commercial use. But that's today. Tomorrow we will see. And then there are newer applications where people can make polymers that uh, when you crack them will repair themselves. That's a pretty smart application. We all know about the frustration of having a plastic object crack and it's gone. You can't glue it. Well, many of them now can repair themselves. They contain what it takes to cover the fracture. Now, what is less well known is the application of polymers in electronics. Everybody in this room, or most people, will have their cell phone. By the way, thank you for not using them right now. <laughs> the cell phone, of course, uh, has uh, operates with uh, many, many plastic parts, but these are standard plastics. What you do not see is inside of your phone are the chips, the computer chips, essentially, that will uh, do the processing of data that will serve for memory storage and so on. And this is where the application of polymers in microelectronic comes. Polymers are critical in making these polymer chips. The chip at the end doesn't have any of these polymers left, but without the polymer, you couldn't make them. So this is quite important. And of course, you find these chips everywhere. In your kitchen, the microwave oven works because it's run with polymer chips to control timing and temperature and so on. Of course, you'll find them in your laptop. You'll find them in all the electronic devices that we use today. So here I show some uh, of microprocessors. Uh, Intel microprocessors have been around for a long time. They are in most of our computers, microcomputers, uh, laptops, and so on. Uh, we all know about the NVIDIA chips. This is a graphic processing unit, which was originally used mostly in games, for gaming applications, but it's finding more and more applications in heavy-duty computing. And these chips, both type of chips, come from a process involving microlithography. Then we have all these memory devices. Again, all of them are made by a microlithography process. So the starting material, of course, is a silicon wafer. <coughs> silicon wafers come in many, many sizes. Today, there are silicon wafers that are 50 centimeters in size, enormous silicon wafers that uh, can be used to produce hundreds of chips at a time. Now, a chip is not something which is just one layer. Typically, they have many, many layers of electronics, one on top of the other. If you have an iPhone 10, for example, a chip which is key to the iPhone 10 as 80 layers, one on top of the other. So this is a very, very complex device, all made by photolithography and a lot of other accessory techniques and a lot of fancy equipment. Now, over the years, the power of computers are in has increased tremendously. When I was a graduate student long, long, long ago, we had a mainframe computer. It was a an IBM 360. It filled an entire room. It had to be air conditioned. And it had a whole lot of memory, 64,000 bits of memory. 64. Wow, that was big. 
Now, later on, we saw the personal computer appear. I remember buying my first Apple super, uh, my supercomputer at the time, it was big brain. And uh, this uh, one had the 16K of memory. It had no storage, it wasn't in, invented yet. So I used a tape recorder for storage. And it was a miracle what it could do. Imagine today, 16K. You couldn't even start to do anything with that. But over the years, technology has changed. And the key element of these microprocessors, memory chips, the transistor, these transistors became smaller and smaller. The idea was if you can pack more transistors on the chip, then you'll have more computing power or more memory power. Okay? So the aim was to insert more and more of these transistors on the chip. And there was a progression over the years, which is illustrated on this slide with the so-called Moore's law, that shows the evolution in the number of transistors, okay, this is this axis, with time. So we are in uh, 2019 now, this slide is not quite up to date, but almost. But notice the numbers. Initially, we started in the 70s with the best calculators had about a thousand transistors. Today, the chip in your iPhone has over three billion transistors on it. And it's the size of my finger nail. Okay, this is amazing. Three billion transistors. So it means, of course, that the size of each transistor is smaller and smaller. Okay? How do you make these transistors? By the way, you shall see here, if you do not follow Moore's law, your company goes bankrupt. Okay? And many, many have done that because it's very expensive to stay with the state of the art. If on the other hand, you follow Moore's law, you can make some significant profits. Ask Samsung, TSMC, and so on. All these companies that have benefit. But today, very few companies actually make these state-of-the-art chips because it's so expensive to build a factory to make these chips. A factory today, a state-of-the-art factory, costs about $10 billion. $10 billion. Okay? So you can't build one everywhere. And believe me, before, almost as soon as it is finished, it's obsolete. You have to move to some new generation. So this is a very, very heavy business. So our job as a scientist involved in this field is simply how to make these transistors, the interconnect, all the lines that go from one level to another, smaller, to keep up with Moore's law. More transistors in the same surface area. So this is done by a process called lithography. It's used for, it was used in many ways for printing, but it is a key process for making these uh, computer chips. So essentially what you do is you take a silicon chip, so imagine this is a silicon chip, okay? You will uh, coat it with a, a, a photoresist. And this photoresist is a polymer. It's a special polymer. It's a polymer that has one property. It is sensitive to light, meaning when it is exposed to light, some change occurs in the polymer. For example, the solubility of the polymer will change. Either you will cross-link it and it becomes less soluble, or you will make it more soluble. So typically, wherever the radiation strikes the surface, a chemical change takes place. Where, oops, in areas where the radiation doesn't come to the surface, no change takes place. So here I have two areas that have received light, and a photochemical reaction has taken place. For example, 
the area that has received light here becomes more soluble in a solvent. I dip the chip in a solvent, and I can get what is called a positive tone image. So it's a three-dimensional image. I make a little valley in areas where light has struck. Alternatively, if I cross-link, make it less soluble, I get a negative tone image. Both processes are used, and they may be used for different layers in the fabrication process. After this, many, many steps follow. But this is the patterning. It defined the dimension of the transistor, for example. So this is a key step. It defined how big your computing power will be at the end. So until uh, 1990, approximately, the state of the art was based on uh, a simple polymer called Novolac. This is uh, a view of uh, the chemical constituents of Novolac. It's a phenolic polymer. It's very important to see this phenolic group because phenols are soluble in base. If you take water, uh, basic water, phenol will dissolve in it. But this was mixed with another compound, which was called the diazonaphtoquinone, the diazonaphtoquinone, this structure, which is a compound that's very, very insoluble in water. When you mix the two, the mixture is not soluble at all. But this diazonaphtoquinone is very sensitive to light. If you expose it to UV, it's transformed into something which now has a carboxylic acid, an acid, acid soluble in base. So what happens when you expose a mixture of Novolac, diazonaphtoquinone to light, you get something which has changed in solubility. So typically, this is shown here in, uh, ah, I have this constant problem. This is red, blue. I, I am a little bit colorblind, so I'm not sure what my slide, and I haven't used this slide in some time, so. Well, whatever color this is, was insoluble in base. <laughs> Red, okay. So uh, if you expose it to light, the solubility, the solubility changed. And this material now is soluble in aqueous base. You get a positive tone image. So this was basically how all computer chips were made until about 1990. Now, this worked very, very well. But the problem was really that uh, to effect this transformation, you had to, this is a cartoon. This would be the polymer, the Novolac. This will be the diazonaphtoquinone. To change the solubility of the whole thing, you had to change all of the diazonaphtoquinone, almost all, most of them so that the solubility of the whole would change. It means a lot of photons. You need at least one photon for this one, one for this one, one for this one. You can see many, many photons. It means you have to expose to light for a long time. And you have to have the right light with the right wavelengths. So these were the limits. The limits were that you use light over wavelengths given wavelengths, which uh, could only produce images of about the same size as the wavelengths of light. And at this time, this was essentially uh, something that would stop the progress of microlithography. Now, the, the resist worked beautifully. These are images of uh, transistors made using this technology. Actually, these are interconnect, but it doesn't matter. Using light at the wavelengths of uh, 365 nanometer, uh, ultraviolet light. The problem is, using light of this wavelengths, you can't make an image this size. So essentially, the wavelengths of light was a limit you had to change the wavelengths of exposure of your polymer. You had to use a shorter wavelength light. 
Shorter wavelengths mean going deeper in the UV from 365 nanometers to maybe 250 nanometers, 193 nanometers, and you could make smaller and smaller features. But then the problem is another problem. When you use light of a shorter wavelength, I should never go away from the microphone. <laughs> when uh, you use light of a shorter wavelength, there are fewer photons available. It's harder to produce these high energy photons. So it means your exposure time would become very, very long. And when you're making billions of transistors, you better go fast. Thank you. So when uh, I started working in this field, I had the good fortune of uh, working with uh, a gentleman working for IBM Corporation who uh, took the time to really explain the problem. He said, okay, this is where we are today and we wish to go there, but how can we do it? We have a limitation with the wavelengths of light. We have another limitation, which is the number of photons that the light source will produce. And then the other limitation is the industry really liked to work with Novolac, Dyson, Neftoquino. They were used to it. Engineers didn't want to change their process. They would have liked to be the same. So we started thinking about this. And very quickly, working together, we started thinking, well, instead of using one photon to do one chemical reaction, why don't we do a chain reaction where one photon does one, two, three, four, five, six, ten chemical reaction, maybe even a hundred? How do you do this? Chain reaction, common in polymer chemistry. When you do a polymerization, you do a chain reaction. Your initiator continues the growth of the chain. So we thought, well, maybe what we could do is make a polymer, and here on this picture, I show a polymer called phthalaldehyde. It's, uh, it was the first chemically amplified photoresist we made. It's a polymer, if you break a bond in it, any bond, it suddenly vaporizes. It all goes into back small molecules. It's very unusual. So we made these polymers and attached something which is sensitive to light. If you irradiate this part of the molecule, you will break this bond. And as soon as this brain bond breaks, it will go to the next bond that will break and again and again and again, a chain reaction. So this was the first of these concept of chemical amplification. One photon, many, many, many reactions. This uh, form of chemical amplification is one where as soon as you expose to light, you essentially have a material that disappears as a vapor, okay? So this is, the, if you compare to photography in those days, it was Polaroid photography, instant photography. The problem with uh, this uh, instant photography, if you will, was it's very attractive in principle, but the engineers who run the complex factories didn't like it at all. They didn't like in a very clean environment of a clean room to have vapors being formed because these vapors might deposit and form a cloud on the lens of the exposure tool. It meant uh, yeah, we really like what you invented, but forget it. We don't want it. We don't want it because it will foul up our optics. Do better. Try to do exactly the same as before. A molecule that you will dip in a solution of base to make an image. By the way, the phthalaldehyde worked well. It made beautiful images, but it was never commercialized. And along the way, being a chemist, we played a lot with other molecules. For example, we developed a polymer, which is shown here. This is a chain composed of these units. 
This is an acetal, a polyacetal. It's very sensitive to acid or heat. And when you heat it, it produces naphthalene. The driving force is aromatization. Okay, this is a very strong driving force. So again, this was something that imaged immediately when exposed to radiation. It produces, at the end, formaldehyde and water. Made very beautiful images, but nobody wanted to use it. Again, go back to the drawing board, invent something better. So the industry essentially was not ready to accept the new process. want to change the way we do imaging. We want to do the same as before, so develop new materials that will mimic the old ones. So eventually, we came up with a, a solution. We made a polymer. This is a polystyrene, which is modified to incorporate this carbonate group, a tertiary carbonate. We know from uh, chemical classes, chemistry classes, that the tertiary carbonates will be sensitive to heat. If you heat this molecule, it will decarboxylate, it will lose CO2. This will become, again, a volatile compound, isobutylene, and you will get a phenol. Oh, this looks better than before. You now have a polymer which is like Novolac. It is, again, a phenol, soluble in base. <coughs> I better move away from this. So eventually, we thought, well, what we could do is take this polymer and combine it with something that, I'll go to the, some, uh, we could uh, take this uh, new polycarbonate that was developed and combine it with a molecule that when exposed to light, generates a proton. We call it a photoacid generator. When you irradiate the sulfonium salt, you get a proton coming out of it. Now, acid will catalyze the reaction of this carbonate, producing a phenol. This was the solution. All we had to do now was to look at how to generate acid by exposure to light. So we looked at many, many compounds. Personally, I looked at uh, the last one. I looked at these uh, esters, which would produce this sulfonic acid. It didn't work very well. But uh, a young chemist joined the team at the time and thought of using these sulfonium salt, iodonium salt, which uh, had been used in the canning industry to uh, to cure films inside of a can. When you take a, a can of food, the inside of the can is coated with a polymer, otherwise it would rust. You don't want rust in your food, okay? And these were cured, the plastic, using one of these onion salts. So we combined all of this and then made up this photoresist, the first chemically amplified photoresist, which was patented eventually in 1985. Uh, this uh, photoresist was used to make uh, some high-powered chips. Uh, I think in uh, 1982, IBM produced the first uh, chip with one meg, megabyte of capacity using this process. Eventually, of course, it moved to uh, higher capacity chips and uh, the key here is that the light-activated catalyst, this onium salt, is one which changes the solubility of an entire chain. So this is the polymer chain. The uh, colored dots here are the carbonate units. This is the photocatalyst. When you shine light on it, it generates a proton. It generates a proton, it's activated, and this proton will travel along the chain and change the solubility of the material as it loses carbon dioxide. Now the beauty of this process is that it's catalytic. You start with a catalyst, you end up with the same catalyst. So it can go on and on. 
This is a chemical amplification. Now, all of this is done using very sophisticated equipment. Initially, when I started in my lab, we worked with a deep UV lamp, which was a very simple piece of equipment, costing maybe $50,000. But very quickly, the industry had to move to more sophisticated light source. Again, to reduce the shorter, to make the wavelength shorter and shorter and shorter, to make smaller and smaller and smaller transistors. So they move from a simple, simple light source going through a mask to these very fancy pieces of equipment. This was still powered by a laser at 193 nanometers. Uh, this piece of equipment cost about $10 million a piece. So a light bulb, you go to the store, you buy a light bulb, 10 million, okay? Uh, okay, tomorrow I want to make things even smaller. So I go to the store and I buy a better light bulb, $100 million, okay? It's, it's amazing. This is just a light bulb, a source of light in extreme UV. If you go to a plant, for example, of a company in Taiwan, which makes many, many of these microprocessors today, uh, you will see in one plant 30 of these machines in a row, 100 million a piece. That means $3 billion, okay? The rest of the plant is another $7 billion. And as soon as the plant is finished, it's starting to get obsolete. You have to think of the next one. So these are major, major investments. In any case, this uh, concept of chemically amplified photoresist has lasted well beyond what I expected it to last. We thought, well, it will go for a few generations of microprocessors. No, it has gone on for more than 20 years. It has gone for 30 years now, and it's still going today. So today, there are some new resists that have been made, some changes in formulation where uh, the idea is to make the material absorbing less light. Uh, fluorination helps you to make it, again, less absorbing of light, and so on. But it's all the same. It's the same old formula. The formula being that you take a material that with the photogeneration of acid will change its solubility. And this has gone on a long time. If you look at uh, the history, for example, just for Intel, you'll find that in 1978, the 80, 86 microprocessors, which I really liked, it was my first IBM personal computer. Uh, this had uh, 29,000 transistors per chip. 29,000, that's a pretty good number. Recently, the generation called Itanium had 3.1 billion transistors. Today, uh, the process is even smaller, 16 nanometers. I don't know, they won't tell us how many transistors there are. Probably around 5 billion transistors. So when you look at your iPhone next time, uh, think about it. There is a chip in there which has five billion transistors. Quite an amazing uh, feat. Not, not everything is smooth. This is an extremely complex field. The instrumentation is very complex and the resist, the material that we make, has become complex because you have to avoid a little bit of impurity and so on. It's extremely sensitive to the formulation. And sometimes accident happens. This came out in the press uh, just earlier this year, February 25, 2019. TSMC, Taiwanese company that produces chips for all the big manufacturers, including uh, Apple and uh, many, many others. TSMC had a little problem. They got a batch of resist that probably was bad. It had a small impurity, probably. 
Now what happened is an entire production of wafers had to be thrown away. How much did that cost? $500 million. $500 million of chips went down to the garbage. Okay? Why? Because probably a little bit of quality control was lacking in uh, making the photoresist. So this, is, uh, this shows uh, how uh, important it is to be able to control all phases of manufacture, from the chemist making the photoresist to those formulating it, and then to these using it. By the way, uh, this little accident has really affected uh, a company called NVIDIA. NVIDIA makes graphic processing units. And the price of graphic processing units went way up all of a sudden because one little plant suddenly couldn't run. It couldn't run because the material sensitive to light didn't work well. So at uh, this point, I think, I will stop and uh, thank my co-workers. This work was initiated uh, at IBM, and later on it was continued both at IBM, in my lab, and in many other places. My main collaborator was Professor Grant Wilson, who is now a professor at the University of Texas. Uh, one uh, of uh, the people who worked for a short time on this is in this room, Dr. Hawker, who worked at IBM for a short time. But uh, I have had many, many co-workers working in this area. And I thank you for your attention. I have here a picture which shows King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, where I spent the last nine years. I had the privilege of being in this country, and it was a great privilege. I really appreciated it. Thank you very much. We have a small gift for you, Esther. I think, uh, I think we should do the gift first, then to our speaker, then we'll open the uh, floor for a few questions. questions, then uh, our speakers probably have a long uh, schedule today, so we should make it brief. Uh, we open the, uh, the floor for a few questions. Any questions? Questions? Please, you can use this one here. I, I have a question, actually. Could you please comment on uh, plastic pollution, and what do you envision the solution for that? Why oh, the solution is beyond uh, an individual. The solution is uh, training of uh, people. We have to train the youth to change the habits of this world. Uh, we also have uh, uh, to uh, change the way we operate. For example, uh, I come, uh, or I live currently in uh, Berkeley in California. And in Berkeley, you can't find a single plastic bag. They are forbidden, outlawed. Uh, in Berkeley, if you go in a restaurant, you cannot order a bottle of Perrier water or any water. It's prohibited. You buy uh, the water that comes from the city. Okay? If you need carbonated water, they carbonate it right there. 
And the result is you don't have all these bottles. These are, we have to change the way we operate. Uh, we have to control uh, the things that we do. And of course, more and more plastics today are recycled. The problem is recycling is expensive. Somebody has to pay for it. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. So, John. Craig. So probably from 20 to 100. And uh, uh, at some point, it would be a problem. Because if you get too many, it means you cover a big surface area. I, I haven't explained all these details. But at some point in our career, we also developed a photo-generated base, uh, which is mixed in the photoresist. It's to stop the movement of this photogenerated acid. So it becomes extremely complicated. So you have two photo reactions at the same time. One needed to do the process, the other one needed to stop it. So you, you want it to be catalytic, but not too catalytic. Not too catalytic. And probably, as we get closer to the resolution, the size of an atom, it will not work anymore. Okay? Something completely different has to be done. And then how small can a transistor be? All right. Uh, Dr. Sudam? Can you comment on the therapeutic use of these bottles? So, you know, the, we had uh, uh, worked for several years on uh, applications in therapeutics, mostly in drug delivery. And... Uh, uh, it's uh, an application which is still in the clinic. Uh, it uh, worked very, very well in animals. It uh, seems it looks good in the clinic. But it's one of many, many ways to address a cancer. So I worked on, uh, in these areas for several years. We uh, developed uh, uh, some uh, molecules, some dendrimers, which carried these uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, we started the company, we sold the company to a, another company, and they are still in clinical trials, in phase three clinical trial today. Maybe as a carrier, right? As a carrier. Then we had another program where we use polymers in uh, immunotherapy, and that I think is more promising. But it's a whole different story, you know. It doesn't mix very well, the two stories. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, please join me again in thanking our speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.